You are listening to Scott H. Silverman's Happy Hour, a podcast released on the first three Wednesdays of the month. Family crisis, relationship crisis, addiction crisis, no two crisis situations are the same. They vary by family, individual, and relationship. They can encompass complex family dynamics, emotional distress, anger issues, and entitlements, and often involve substance abuse. This podcast addresses these issues and others surrounding the addiction epidemic currently plaguing this country and the world. There is hope and help. Are you stuck, scared, or unsure of what to do next? If a situation with a loved one, spouse, or even a child has started to spiral, possibly becoming dangerous or threatening, it's time to seek help. My name is Scott H. Silverman. I help families navigate crisis situations. I'm the person you turn to in order to get you and your loved ones unstuck. Welcome back to the show. This is Scott H. Silverman's Happy Hour. I'm Michael Glenn Moore, Scott's co-host. Scott, what do we expect of our listeners? We don't expect much, but what do we expect? <laughs> well, you know, it's a great question, Michael. Good to, good to see and hear from you today. I, I think our listeners are slacking off a little bit and our viewers. I think we want them to help us get the word out. We want them to, you know, share the links, ask people to take a look, and then give us feedback. Let us know what we can do to help how we can position ourselves to pivot or potentially focus on an issue that's relevant to what we're doing on our platform, which is about helping families and their loved ones, you know, do the best they can to navigate to the highest and best level of support and care. So really want to encourage people that are listening. You know, it's like, I remember in the classroom, they, you know, the teacher starts to lecture. It talks about people that aren't there on time. When you're the person who's on time and you're sitting there listening to it and the person's not there, it always used to piss me off. So we just want to invite people, you know, to share the information, and let us know how we can go and grow and listen to us wherever they can and, and share hopefully the important content that we're sharing. And you're going to hear more about very special content today. And, you know, so we really want to invite our listeners to do that. And again, you know, you, you guys have got my number. I'll give it out again. It's area code 619-993-2738. 619-993-2738. So call or text me for anything that I can do around the areas of what I'm involved with. Scott A. Silverman, you can Google me. And if you can't find something that we can relate to together, then uh, there, there's something I haven't done well, or you actually haven't turned your monitor on to read the messaging that's on the website. So anyway, with that, well, Michael, if you're ready, I'll get us started and we'll sure. kick it out. Why don't you go ahead and give your email too, just in case. My email? Yeah, it is Scott at yourcrisiscoach.com, yourcrisiscoach.com. But Google me, Scott A. Silverman. Find me anywhere on social media, on LinkedIn, uh, Instagram. Um, and then you can find all of our, what we're doing on Spotify, on Apple. And if you don't hear us somewhere, let, you know, let us know. We'll try to figure out a way to pipe it in. Sounds good. All right, go ahead and tell us about our guest. All right. Well, today we have a couple people who I, I've met recently and... Um, I don't want to say I've fallen in love with them, you know, because then each one of them will want to know, was it me or was it her or was it him? But two people that, you know, sometimes you meet somebody and you go, God, I don't owe them money. They don't owe me money. And there's just some sort of emotional connectivity. And I think I've told both of you that, that, you know, brothers and sisters from a different mother, but, uh, you know, just a, a kindred spirit and a passionate stakeholder. So I'm, I'm going to start with Lisa. I've got a little bio here, um, who's the co-founder. We're going to be talking about the Jamie Daniels Foundation, and Jamie is their son, or was their son. I don't know how you frame that. Their son that they lost, and they'll tell their story. But I'm going to read a little bit about Lisa, and then Ken, and who's the significant other, or the, 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 the cohort, and the father of Jamie. So Lisa Daniel Goldman was born and raised in Toronto, Canada, but relocated with her family to Michigan in 1998. As a stay-at-home mom, Lisa stayed busy with her children's sports, dance schedules, while also volunteering at their schools. She, la she later worked in real estate before starting her own baking business. Yeah. Okay, I want to make sure it wasn't banking, baking business. Not I got baking. it right. After her son's Jamie's death in 2016, Lisa shut down her business and focused her time solely on the opioid crisis. As co-founder of the Jamie Daniels Foundation, and the website is Jamie Daniels, plural, DanielsFoundation.org. 
go there and, and look them up. Lisa's spoken in front of numerous audiences, including the United States House of Representatives. And I believe probably during every waking hour advocates to get the message out on how uh, resources are out there and there's hope and there's help. And Ken Daniels on, uh, and he's older, so his bio's a little longer. Sorry, Ken. I'll get you out there as soon as I can. On September 6, 1997, Ken Daniels achieved his lifetime goal, becoming the TV play-by-play -play voice of the National Hockey League team, hired by the Detroit Red Wings to be their lead hockey announcer in the Fox Sports Detroit. Ken's been rewarded for his efforts on many occasions. In 2002, he was named by the readers of the Detroit Free Press as best play-by-play -play announcer. In 2006, he won his first Michigan Emmy Award for Excellence in Television Play-by-Play. -play. 2003 and 2010, Ken was named Michigan Sportscaster of the Year by the National Sportscasters and Sports Writers Association. Also in 2010, Ken received the Detroit Sports Media Tyson Award. T it's a T.Y. Tyson Award, is that correct? Hi, for excellence Tyson. Ty, Ty Tyson, okay, mm -hmm. Award for Excellence in Sports Broadcasting, tells you how much I know about sports. In the spring of 2013, Ken was named sports, top sportscaster in Michigan in Detroit for free press role. Ken's son, Jimmy, had often joked that dad needed a summer job. Unfortunately, he gave him one. Ken is co-founder of the Jamie Daniels Foundation, dedicated to ending the shame and stigma that surrounds drug addiction and building a long-term, safe, sober living home in Oakland County, Michigan. So today, Lisa and Ken, the, the next few minutes are all yours. And before I go to the questions, I'd like to give each one of you a, a minute or two, whatever you'd like, and just share with us from your head or your heart or combination of both, why we're here and why you're here and what we, we, are, we our listeners and viewers can do to uh, not only hear your message, but be of support as well. Go ahead, Lisa. Well, why we're here. Um because as a family, as parents who have um, had a son struggling with the disease of substance use disorder, it needs to be spoken about. And um, you know, our goal is to help educate and end the stigma that surrounds substance use disorder so that people can get help. And you know, that, that stigma precludes recovery. And if people understand that you know, we were a, a normal, I guess, air quotes, a normal family um, who, who had a child who suffered um, by self-medicating. And, um, and it was important for us to speak out. And that's why we're here. And we'll do that any time of any day that anybody will listen. And even when they won't listen, we'll still say it. Yes. You know, when, when Jamie was on Adderall because he, he thought he was stupid and needed more time, time on tests, and yet he wasn't, he was quite bright. Um, you know, we believe it, it started there in high school, and then a friend introduced him to opioids in the freshman year at college after all the doctor prescribed it can't hurt you. And, uh, you know, it's um, everyone's different. Addicts don't wake up one day and say, let's screw up the rest of my life. Let's take some pills today. And within five days, Jamie was hooked and somehow graduated from Michigan State with a 3.5, wanted to get into sports management or be a sports agent. Um, he was friends with everyone on that uh, basketball team at Michigan State when they were great. If there was a party when they were getting to the final four, they came to the frat house because Jamie wanted them there. And uh, he could just befriend everybody. But I think that he thought when he was uh, medicated, he came out of his shell. And I think that's what it does to you. It gives you a, a different persona, although he had a great personality. People loved him. He'd bring kids into a group and, and graduated with a 3.5 from Michigan State. And, and both Lisa and I know that when Jamie finally said to us, um, you know, and made that phone call, I need to go to rehab after a couple of times where it didn't work in Michigan. Uh, and we sought out Florida and then got into the Florida shuffle and, you know, the greedy side of the recovery business. And, and ultimately, uh, Jamie passed. But back in 2015, 2016, we knew nothing about that. And as parents, I think we suffered the shame and, and stigma that surrounds addiction that that's why we're here, uh, to get others not to do what we did. And we acquiesced to Jamie's wishes um, to keep it quiet because we're all embarrassed. Well, the embarrassment has to stop and we need to talk about it. And that's why we're here. That's why we do what we do to get people talking about it so they don't suffer the same fate we did. So let me go over to you, Lisa. Tell us a little bit about the struggles you guys have faced while, while you were going through, because I think you kind of outlined, Ken, you know, what 
what kind of led to maybe some of his drug use. And there's obviously a lot of different things in the background, but tell us about the struggles you faced while you were going through, uh, you know, his treatment and trying to help him uh, better support him. Because obviously, not obviously, but a lot of parents like yourselves, and I've seen this in relationships, when I hear a, a significant other say, I had no idea my husband was doing cocaine for the last 10 years. You know, and they're living in the same house, working in the same house, raising kids together, traveling together, but never knew it. I mean, literally, I and I can't tell you how many hundreds of times I've heard that. So it happens a lot, you know, because how do you get trained for this? What do you, you know, how do you identify the signs? So, but for you guys, what was that, what was that like, Lisa? Well, you know, as Kenny alluded to, when Jamie was in high school and he did suffer from test anxiety, they that they tested him for in school, but never did a teacher ever mention ADD or ADHD. And Jamie recognized that, um, you know, unfortunately, they wouldn't give him the extra test time um, just for well, where he fell on the chart, you know, on the scale of how well he did in school. And he, after seeking out a therapist who unbeknownst to us, put him on a computer test to test him for ADD or ADHD, you know, five weeks later, which was one, one day a week going to this therapist, he said, he suffers from ADHD. He's like off the charts and needs Adderall. He had already told Jamie, he had already called the pediatrician and my fight with him and my words to the pediatrician were, there's no way, but this is the most meticulous kid there is. You know, everything, color coordinated, everything. He, sometimes I couldn't tell his writing from the teachers. And I, I mentioned that because it was, you know, Adderall being sold to the doctors as a non-addictive drug that we give to four-year-olds now. Um, we know how addicted it is. So I, we agreed to let Jamie go on Adderall during the week while he was at school, no weekends, no summers, the whole to do. Not knowing what it would do to somebody who actually did not have ADD and you give them medication like any other, you know, you give somebody medication they don't need, it's going to wreak havoc with you. And as Kenny mentioned again, then he goes off to university He's still taking Adderall, but he was hazed with prescription medication. So in order to get in, into his fraternity, and it, it wasn't just Jamie's fraternity, I mean, sororities do it. So Jamie wasn't living at home and we didn't see him on a day-to-day -day basis. And when he did come home, it was masked very well. So for a time, until it wasn't until you looked at him and he stumbled or he wasn't paying attention or he was falling asleep while he was in the middle of a conversation and not knowing anyone who has gone through this, not having any idea of what that meant other than maybe he's studying too long or up too late or, you know, out with his friends too late. And it finally came down to knowing that Jamie has a problem with, a, a, uh, with prescription medication. And we found that out going into his second semester of senior year. And I called therapists up in where he went to school, which is East Lansing, Michigan. He was a, a student at Michigan State University. And we had a friend up there who was a retired judge who gave me the name of a, a very well-known therapist. And in this conversation I had with this therapist, he said, don't worry, Lisa, I see kids like this all the time. Don't worry, we'll find. So what did he found him a therapist, it happened to be his son and Jamie started seeing him. Well, they continued to prescribe the Adderall. Jamie has no paperwork that says he has ADD or ADHD. I don't have it. I mean, I've looked for it. There is nothing because when I walked out of that therapist's office that day that he told us, that he had ADHD or ADD, I said, no way. You've just been snookered by a 15 year old and we had a fight and I left the office. I got no paperwork. And it was every therapist that Jamie went to continued to prescribe him that Adderall. It got to the point where I had a deal with the uh, pharmacist 
to cut the Adderall into 30 pills. So I would get three bottles and tell Jamie that I couldn't get the full prescription because nationally you couldn't get your hands on Adderall anymore. It was in the papers that the pharmacies could not stock Adderall because so many kids were taking Adderall in 2012 or 13, I believe it was. Anyway, fast forward, Jamie does graduate from Michigan State and is trying to detox himself um, while he's at his job and it obviously isn't going well. And between Kenny and I, it was, you know, Jamie's over 18 now, so just over 18. We couldn't do anything. And we finally said to him, you pick up the phone and you check yourself in. We, um, we found a treatment center here in Michigan and Jamie called and registered himself. And the next morning we were supposed to show up and it was swipe your credit card at the door for them to unlock the door. We walked him in and checked him in for his 12 days. I learned more about his therapist's own treatment and issues with his own family than I did with Jamie when we went to talk. And by the, by the day when the day that we went to pick him up and check Jamie out, and I said, you know, what do we do now? This is 12 days later. What do we do now? Can you still see him as his therapist? And they said, well, no. Um, and the bottom line was the statement they gave me was, you can Google therapists. That's how we walked out. There was no treatment, no schedule of anything, nothing to help him going forward. We had paid in full and walked out the door. They didn't want to see or hear from us again. And within two weeks, Jamie relapsed. And it was a struggle. And we went through probably the next year on and off with Jamie. Um, and I did Google therapists and finally found him one um, who wouldn't give him the Adderall. But at that same time, he had been seeing a psychiatrist who was prescribing him now not only the Adderall, but sleeping pills. And well, there were a couple of other things in there um, that I can't remember, but it was just, you know, he was a pharmacologist. Let's just write the prescriptions. And he knew because Kenny and I had Jamie in the car and we told, said to Jamie, you have to call this psychiatrist and tell him that you've just gotten out of treatment, that you're addicted to prescription medication and you can no longer see him because we didn't want him giving him prescriptions anymore. And he did while we sat in the car. So he knew full well of what was going on with Jamie. And it was within, I guess, several weeks after that, I, that I couldn't find a therapist for Jamie. And he came to us and said, I'm really comfortable with that guy that I was seeing. Can I go back to him? And we thought, well, now that he knows that Jamie's been in treatment and he knows about his addiction, sure. You know, who better do you want? Of course you wanted, you know, growing up, you wanted to see a psychiatrist. That was, that was, the, that was the cream of the crop. Um, not anymore, but so we let Jamie go back. And unfortunately in searching Jamie's room, again, finding the Adderall, the sleeping pills, you know, Trazodone. I mean, I can't even remember the names of the, the prescriptions that I found from this guy. And it was just this, this, you know, hamster wheel that we were on. It was just running in circles constantly. And there was nowhere to turn. Every time I'd go on the computer and I would Google addiction treatment and I would get beautiful beachfront property pictures and 800 numbers. And I can't tell you the number of times that I picked up the phone to call, but I was so afraid of, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was saying. I really didn't know what was going on. I didn't understand any of it. And, you know, we were learning on the fly and that's how, you know, we ended up, I ended up Googling therapists and Jamie said, I would go to basically a mom. That's what he wanted. I, he wanted a mom, not somebody too old, not a man, but somebody like a mom. And that's who I found. And she spent an hour and a half on the phone with me. And then she spent an hour and a half on the phone with Jamie and he really liked her and she was really nice. And she did actually specialize in addiction. Um, 
and she had trained in Florida. And that's how Jamie ended up in Florida because the place, the people that she knew at this um, uh, treatment facility that he went to, this inpatient um, treatment center, um, she had recommended. And that's how he ended up in Florida, probably almost a year after he, almost a year to the day after he got out of um, treatment here in Michigan and, um, and went there. And he had spent a, about 10 days in hospital here and they detoxed him properly in the hospital. And the next day he was on a flight to Florida. So and the Paul Harvey to her story, I know you know Paul Harvey, and the rest of the story is that in his sobriety, he told us that he duped the therapist to fail the test, to think that he had ADD. Right. So he knew what he was doing. So, so Lisa, thank you for sharing that. I, I picked up probably nine different things that we don't do with families anymore based on my own experience, uh, you know, and, and I have people call me all the time because I'm, you know, I'm out there in front of the media and they want me to help them get medication. And I said, you know, that's not a problem, but here's what we have to do. There'll be, um, we're going to send you to a medical professional. They're going to do full blood work. They're going to do a UA. They're going to test you. And then you're going to have a full assessment. And then after that, they'll determine uh, what you might need if you do need it and the dosing that goes along with it. How's that sound? By the end of that, probably seven out of 10 people hang up because what they're doing is they're, they're unfortunately they're drug seeking and that's what they want. And I, you know, I put a speed bump there, not a you know, full you know, garage door so they can't get through it because I want to slow it down. But I understand that. And, and it's even tougher now because prescription writing has slowed down, thank God, finally. And you saw some of these settlements in the last couple of weeks with Johnson Johnson and some of the distributors and Purdue. So Ken, let me go back to you and ask you, um, after hearing Lisa's description of kind of the, the journey that you both were on, what would you tell parents with what you've learned? If somebody were to call you this afternoon and, and they said, look, I, I've got three minutes with the quarters that I put in my you know, pay phone. What would you tell them you know, in a three minute drill that, that they should do as, as, as quickly as possible in a sequence that you think of priority, but you have Three minutes to tell them because they're, you know how that, you know how the family is. They're, they're in panic, mm -hmm. you know, they're in desperation. Um, they're more than likely don't trust the, the child anymore or the therapist or themselves. And, you know, they just, they need a lifeline. What would you do to give them a lifeline in a short period of time? This is a great question. Well, first of all, it is a family thing. And I think the family all has to be on board with this. You, you can't isolate. And, you know, we didn't tell our uh, close family, brothers, sisters, we didn't. And, and they were pretty pissed at us for not sharing. Yeah. But when a family, you know, first off at jamiedanielsfoundation.org, if someone is struggling and you are looking for a therapist or a place um, for rehab or detox, we do have a list of questions under the help section uh, to ask. Um, because we didn't know what to ask. If even if you phone somewhere with those fancy names and everything else, what are you getting? You know, is it dual diagnosis? What are you looking for? Um, I, it's uh, to me, we refer to, to people that we're working with now here in Michigan, and we refer them to get people the help to get into detox right away and a proper place and a safe place. Um, that's the first thing we do. Um, you know, because you know that addicts can turn anything on a dime. They, they can lie with the best of them. So you're not going to get an answer out of them. Um, so I on, honestly, Scott, I don't really know what the answer is. And we immediately call people we know who deal with this and crisis management in a moment um, to get them the help they need. And they go out and seek out the person. I yeah. don't know. I, what would you tell someone in that moment? If you had one minute, I don't know. What yeah. would you, I'm, I'm honestly asking you. What would no, you no, say? And I, and, and I'm going to answer that question, but first I want to correct you. They don't lie with the best of them. They lie better than all of them. Yeah. You know, and, and I, and I, I'm doing that tongue in cheek because lying, right. cheating and manipulating are tools that most people who suffer from this addiction use and they use so well, it's organic and they'll, they'll listen to what you have to say. They'll spin it. They'll twist it. They'll tweak it. They'll spin it around. They'll live in that cul-de-sac. They'll just get it stuck in a loop. And they will, you know, if, especially if they're on any kind of stimulant, they'll talk all night long until you all go to sleep. But as soon as you go to sleep, they'll go get some more stuff. Now, I will get slammed for saying that because people say, well, you're stigmatizing people. Well, you know, between, you know, eradicating the stigma, which is I'm a big, big supporter of, but also I, I belong to an anonymous program where we stand up 
whatever we share and remind people we're a drug addict and alcoholic. And there's science around that that says that's negative, you know, reinforcement. But on the other hand, sometimes those anonymous rooms are the only place someone can go if they don't have a lot of resources. And unfortunately, the treatment industry, as I'm sure you probably have found out, you know, it has a 95% failure rate. So to answer your question, what I tell families is, first of all, you're not trained to do this. No one's trained to do this. I mean, I have a lot of experience. I'm a resource. And what I do is I refer people to the highest level and best level of care that I can. But what's important is to get the family to take a deep breath, to slow down. It's like, it's like when your neighbors, if you see your neighbor's house is on fire, but you're handcuffed to a door in your home, what are you going to do? You're going to have to get very creative. So well, what I encourage families to do is to take a deep breath and then re refer them to go to someone who understands it, you know, and, and I don't have a database of you know, people like me around the country, but there are, there are all kinds of intervention mechanisms, a faith-based leader, a very good friend, a family member, because you were saying that, you know, you didn't tell family, and there might've been a family member of yours, if you're one of those families that, you know, we're one of those families that people verbally throw up on each other all the time, we can't keep any freaking secrets. But you may have had a brother or, or an outlaw that had a, you know, family mm -hmm. member went through this. And there's a great resource because they they can walk you down the path. I mean, it's different today because now we're, we're doing things like this. This wasn't going on 10 years ago. There weren't families doing this kind of thing. You know, and I've, I don't know, I've got a few families in my book that have lost family members. So that's mm -hmm. what I would tell people. So let me let me go on because I know our time's running lo low here. Tell us a little bit about your foundation. Lisa, would you like to, you know, what, what led you to start the foundation and what do you want to accomplish with it? I want to stay with the format. So Sure. So um, we started the Jamie Daniels Foundation in, in June of 2018. Um, and, and really, I have to say that we probably started it once, once we found out what had happened to Jamie, what the actual story was behind his death, um, which you know, wasn't just an everyday, it, it, you know, it, we thought as a family, there is no way we could stay silent anymore. You know, one of the main reasons that we didn't say anything is because Jamie was so afraid that he would be judged by his peers. And I, you know, when I, I look today and I, I realize how many friends and how many people around him are struggling and were struggling and how many lives have been lost, um, you know, unfortunately, it was a, a, a club bigger than what he ever thought it was. And it was really important for us as the Daniels family, um, you know, even for Jamie's sister to, to be able to talk about Jamie and talk about what happened. And what we have said before um, was, you wanna talk about the Daniels family? Go right ahead, talk about it. Talk about Jamie, talk about what happened to him because if that can save one life, um, then we've done, we've done okay. And, um, you know, our hearts are broken forever. There is no healing. There is no, uh, no closure. Um, this is, this is the pain that we live with day in and day out. Um, we all do. And so do his friends. But so we started the Jamie Daniels foundation to help, um, provide resources, education, and support to individuals and families suffering with SUD. We partnered with the Children's Foundation. And, you know, so we do gear ourselves toward kids, you know, young adults, um, but we work to help everybody. So if anyone is in distress, and as Kenny said, you know, if you contact the foundation, we do have resources here that we will contact because we are not professionals and we don't claim to be, but we have professionals on our advisory board that we can call in a, you know, in five minutes of, of reading an email um, and have done on several occasions um, and, and they will help. And what we've done is in the last three years, so we're now three years old and we have worked very hard to raise funds um, and we have, you know, written over two hundred thousand dollars worth of grants um, so far, and which to programs that we are so proud of. And our first grant was to the Michigan State University Collegiate Recovery Program, and our grant helped pay for a full-time peer recovery coach and 
any member of the collegiate recovery program on that campus has somebody that they can contact 24 seven if they are struggling. So if they have been in recovery and they wanna get back to their studies or are incoming freshmen, but they have gone through recovery, they can apply to be a member of the, this collegiate recovery program. We have since expanded our university outreach. We are now covering um, four universities total in Michigan thus far, um, but we're not, you know, we're not just stuck in Michigan. So if there is a good collegiate recovery program out there and they need help with funds, which everyone does, um, we would definitely take a look at that and make sure that it's something that will help the kids um, on a daily basis. And also with the Michigan State um, grant that we wrote, they have, um, they will provide a scholarship, the Jamie Daniels Memorial Scholarship for kids who are getting back to their education, who lost their funding because they had to leave to go into recovery. Um, or again, freshmen coming in that need help with their studies. And as long as you're a member of the Collegiate Recovery Program, you can apply for scholarship and, um, and uh, to live in their dorm. So um, the other programs that we have um, written uh, grants to our, you know, we work with leaders in the recovery field. We um, help fund programs for life skills to um, help with job training, with education and community support services. We have um, also um, written grants to support evidence-based substance use um, prevention programs that are geared toward high school kids and their parents. And when we talk about the stigma, you know, parents don't know where to turn or who to call and who to talk to. These are programs that help um, many different um, parents and students understand that there is help out there and it's not to be ashamed of. Yep. So that's, 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 <laughs> that's, that's, that's great. And that's, that's a lot of information. So um, quick question for you, Ken, what what can our listeners, viewers, I say listeners, because a lot of people are listening to podcasts, not watching them nowadays, but what can our, our you know, our audience that, that hopefully uh, will hear this message, what would you want to tell them? How can they help, you know, your organization? What would you want them to know? And then also share with us um, your contact information. Then we'll swing it over to Michael, see if he has any questions, because he always asks the the best questions of the podcast. But first to you, Ken, then we'll go to Michael, and then we'll let uh, one of you or both of you close this up with your uh, special thoughts. Well, you know, jamiedanielsfoundation.org uh, is our site. And again, um, if someone is struggling, there there are resources there and what to ask. And you can hear Jamie's story. Um, we're doing another celebrity roast of uh, Hockey Hall of Famer Brett Hull, which will again be virtual. It'll run in November on YouTube. So you can find that. There's a great silent auction. Our two roasts have raised over, uh, well, close to $600,000, or it'll, the two that we've done so far, Mickey Redman, my broadcast partner, and Scotty Bowman, legendary coach. One was live. Uh, this will be the second virtual. There'll be another one. So, you know, in the time we've been around, we're raising funds and then to, to write grants. So if anyone wants to help or donate uh, and to continue the conversation and use Jamie's story as a starting off point to tell their kids and say, as, as Lisa said, talk about the Daniels family, this is what can happen. So don't hide behind it. I, I know there's shame in the family, but if it's not happening in your house, and, and let's hope it's not, it's probably happening two or three doors down. Yeah. Okay, uh, real quick, Mike, before we go to you, if right now this, the, the statistics unfortunately show that there's 240 people in our country each day, an airplane crash overdosing with opioids. So that's 240 families that, that have uh, involuntarily or mandatorily uh, have to join an organization of, of a lot losing of a family member. And I can't even imagine what that's like. So I just, I bring that up because you're, you're certainly not alone, but what, what, a, what a team to have to get on or be part of. But if we can use that, energy and that synergy and your experience to teach and help spread hope and help then you know I, I really want to thank you both for for being here today and sharing your message because I think it, I know it's going to resonate with others and that's how we're going to reduce stigma build awareness 
help educate and inform, and bottom line, help save lives. So hopefully your experience will, you know, if you will, leverage it in a positive way. So Michael, uh, anything from you? And then we'll let them close up with thoughts. No, I really, I don't have any questions actually this time. Uh, I want to thank you both for taking the time to share this. I know it's difficult to, to talk about things like this at, at times, but you have a noble cause that I hope uh, will catch on and that people listening who need help can, you know, contact your organization and find the help they need uh, through your work and, and effort that you put put into it. Uh, Lisa, why don't you go ahead and give your quote and then we'll ask for Ken and see the show out. Sure. Well, I would say that empathy is the highest form of knowledge because it comes without judgment. Okay, Ken, go ahead. What's your quote? Very true on that. And uh, I like to say, we're not here to see through one another. We're here to see one another through. Mm -hmm.